Hello, everyone, and welcome to Open Classroom. My name is Gary Parker. I'm the Associate Dean for External Affairs at the Brown School at Washington University in St. Louis, where I also have the great privilege of directing the Clark Fox Policy Institute. The Clark Fox Policy Institute is dedicated to the uh, well-being of children and the adults who care for them, and we do that by translating empirical research into evidence-based policy for dissemination to policymakers and legislators so they can make informed, empirical, data-driven decisions when it comes to policy on kids and their caretakers. And uh, this is Open Classroom. We are nearing our one year anniversary of the Open Classroom uh, initiative. It is the way that we have been opening the virtual doors uh, to Washington University and uh, featuring some of the amazing scholars, some of the amazing students, some of the amazing alumni, as well as quite a few number of, of really provocative uh, community panels uh, all of which are on the Open Classroom YouTube page, which can be found at the Brown School's uh, YouTube page. And I would encourage you to just uh, scan through some of that amazing uh, programming. I know that you'll find something that is of interest to you. So we're going to have a really terrific program. I just want to let you know that uh, your cameras and microphones have been disabled. However, we still want you to be a part of today's conversation. Please use the chat feature to send in questions, your thoughts, uh, or if you wanna put in some links to resources, we've had folks that have done that before. If you wanna engage with everyone that's here, just check the option that says to all panelists and attendees. If you just want uh, your comments to come to us, then you just click that selection to be all panelists. And I'm joined here by my co-hostess with the mostest. She's the director of professional development at Rockstar and a really amazing, wonderful person and a friend. Please welcome Janet Gillow. Thank you so much, Gary, and welcome everybody. Uh, before we get started with today's program, I just wanna give you a sense of some of what is coming up next week on Open Classroom. We continue to stay very busy one year into what's become a great experiment for us in digitally connecting with you. So on Tuesday of next week, that's March the 23rd, Dr. Elvin Gang is delivering a talk on adaptive strategies for retention in HIV care in Africa. That's a program offered in partnership with our friends at the International Center for Child Health and Development. On Wednesday, March the 24th, Dr. David Curiel from WashU School of Medicine is delivering the last in our series on um, the COVID vaccine. And this talk is gonna specifically be about the evidence-based science that drove vaccine development. Um, so if you have technical questions about the vaccines, if something that you're hearing in the news, you wanted to ask an expert, we have just the guy for you. On Thursday next week, that's the 25th, uh, Dr. Sarah Moreland Russell is going to be delivering a program that's also a part of the series that, that we're doing today. She'll be speaking to theories of policy change and that's offered in partnership with the Brown School's Policy Scholars Program. But here at Open Classroom, we've been able to offer the range of programming that we have in part due to the partnerships that we have on campus and off. And today's program is made possible by the Masters of Social Policy Program to represent that group and to introduce today's speakers. Please welcome my friend, Assistant Professor of Practice, Assistant Dean for Policy Initiatives, Dan Ferris. <laughs> That's, <laughs> that was the greatest introduction. Uh, thank you, hostess of the mostest, Janet, and uh, Janet's four-legged uh, friends at home. Uh, so I'm Dan Ferris. I use he, him pronouns. I'm faculty at the Brown School and lead training and education initiatives at the Social Policy Institute at WashU. Special shout out to graduate policy scholars, program participants joining us today. I have the privilege of serving as the Assistant Dean at the Brown School, responsible for the MSP program, the Master of Social Policy, uh, which is a one-year program for students interested in building advanced policy skills, knowledge, and network. It's open as a dual degree option to Brown School students, uh, students enrolled in select global partner universities, uh, and recently opened to anyone with a previously completed graduate degree. Uh, so the program itself has five foundational areas uh, consistent with policy studies more broadly. Uh, policy analysis, obviously, uh, politics, economics, statistics, and what brings us here today, management and leadership. Uh, so it is my great honor and privilege and pleasure to introduce everyone to Andy and Gerard, uh, who co-led the development of a new course uh, at the Brown School in Public Administration, Finance, and Government Budgeting that they will be debuting uh, and co-teaching together 
uh, in the fall uh, of 2021. Uh, so with a special sneak peek uh, of over this critical topic area uh, and the chance for them to say a little bit more about themselves and their background uh, in this dynamic field, I will turn things over with emoji claps and real claps uh, and perhaps even dogs barking in the background uh, to Andy and Gerard. Welcome and thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Hollins, would you like to go first? I will. Thank you, Andy. Uh, my name is Gerard Hollins. I'm an adjunct professor at Washington University teaching two courses, will be three in the fall. Um, but my day job, I am currently the Director of Revenue for St. Louis County, um, which is responsible for collecting all personal property and real property taxes, approximately over $3 billion annually. Prior to that, I was the fiscal advisor to the Board of Aldermen for the city of St. Louis, which I did for several years, advising the Board of Aldermen on all financial matters, including all economic incentives and the city's annual budget, which we'll talk a little bit about today of a billion dollars. Andy? And I'm Andy Thysing, and my, uh, well, I, I've been teaching uh, at least one of the foundation courses in social work. Uh, at Brown School for about 10 years now, and I really enjoy it. But my day job is a professor of political science at SIUE. And I'm an urbanist, so I spend a lot of time in cities, and I've spent a lot of my career working in East St. Louis in particular. And so I've worked, uh, worked with a lot of the institutions there, and they are, uh, you know, they're just such hardworking folks in, in East St. Louis. And so I always try and uh, always try and, and, and use them, uh, use East St. Louis in my scholarship as much as I can so that we can have a better understanding of what's happening at street level in so many parts of our region. Today, we are going to talk about, we're going to talk about public administration and these, these connections with social work and, and some of these specific dynamics that get involved in, in understanding in administering all of these social policies. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen and I have to make a couple clicks and then we will jump right in. One, two, three, four. Look at that. So hopefully you're all seeing it now. Um, I'm gonna start us off and then Dr. Holland's gonna talk for a little bit and then I'll wrap us up at the end. Um, I'm historically grounded in my work, and I think it's very important that we understand how we got to a particular place, uh, as well as what to do when we're in that that space. And so, I'd like to I'd like to start by by making some important connections uh, with social work and and public administration. And and really, if we look back, and since this is Women's History Month, let's focus on some of these great pioneering women who really define social work. Uh, a century ago and more. Um, and, and they seem to have a constant theme in their work that, that social work is something that's in the public interest. And therefore the work of government should either replace or, or supplement that, that social work that they've been doing from a private philanthropical perspective. And so people like Jane Addams in Chicago were out there arguing that, that you know, life at home, life in the neighborhoods, you know, are, are, are attached to City Hall and they affect the way City Hall can work. And, and locally in St. Louis, our, our local Jane Addams was Charlotte Rumble. And, and, and she would go out and do these studies of, of housing in St. Louis. This was her, her probably her most significant publication. Um, housing conditions in St. Louis from 1908, and and she was very quick to to talk about how these these conditions affect decision makers. And and I love this line from her report: it "says In the democracy of the streetcar jam, we all come in perilously close contact with it all." And Mary Church Terrell, uh, who was the the head of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. And you know, she talked about how the mission of her work was to raise to the highest plane the, the you know, home life, moral standards, and civic life of people. So we're trying to get these, you know, here are all these folks who are taking the social concern and, and pushing it toward decision making. 
And so it came to be known as city, I'm sorry, as municipal housekeeping. And, and to me, when this movement really took off at the turn of the last century, that's when social work and government became inextricably linked. By the way, this is a picture of an early street cleaner right here in St. Louis. And so the, 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 the parts of that, then, if we're going to, if we're going to look at the, the sort of public side of this, the public sector side, it really has two big components to it. There's the money side and there's the people side. And so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Hollins because we're going to start with the money side. And again, because it's Women's History Month, I put a picture up of the $1 bill when Martha Washington was on it. Did you know that Martha Washington was on the $1 bill at one time? Thank you, Andy. And that's a great, great segue. And one of the things I want to first say is, as someone who runs a department and is immersed in, in managing a budget at the department level, money and people are related. Right. Whenever there's a budget cut, whenever there is money taken away from the department, you lose people. People are services. Right. And so there's no there's no disconnection between that. And so and that's at the state level. That's at the federal level. That's particularly at the local level, which I really drill down into in my presentation. So going to start very briefly and talk about the federal level and then jump right to the local budget of the city of St. Louis. And so one of the first things to really understand about the federal budget process is that there's kind of a big fanfare at the beginning where the president introduces the budget, um, creates the budget with the Office of Budget and Management and sends it over to Congress. And Congress says, thank you very much. We're gonna rewrite the budget ourselves, right? And that's generally what happens, right? And they look at that initial request from the, from the president as kind of his, his or her wish list of, of what they would want to see in the budget. But the budget at the federal level is really controlled, enacted, and enforced by Congress. And that is something to really understand. You can jump to the next slide, Andy. The budget is another important thing about the budget is to understand is a budget is a moral document, right? It is a moral document. I always tell my students, if you want to understand what the priorities of any government is, look at how they spend their money, right? But before, before you look at how you spend the money, you have to understand how you bring the money in, right? Um, particularly at the local level, you have to understand where your dollars are coming from because if you do something to impact how that revenue flows in, you have no money to spend on services, right? And so at the federal level, it, it, the, the percentages generally don't change year to year. The important thing to really understand at the federal level is that individuals pay the majority of taxes, right? 77 to 80% of taxes that the federal government receives comes out of paychecks and your income taxes, which are individual, right? And so that is something to understand. Corporations only pay anywhere from 10 to 12% of taxes received and the rest come from miscellaneous and, and basically duties on, on import export, right? And so when you think about the federal budget, corporations are not providing the funding for the federal budget, it's you and I. Right. It is our paychecks, whether through FICA or your what you pay in your federal income taxes, you know, at this time of year. You can jump to the next slide. Andy. Now, let's talk about the spending, the moral part of a, of a document. One of the things to really understand about the federal government is their budget. A lot of the money is mandated. So which means they don't have a choice on how to spend it. Social Security, Medicaid, which it's over half the budget, that is that is basically at the local level, a special fund, they have to spend it that way. They don't have a choice. So when you dig into the budget, the interest and debt is another area you have to pay your bills, right? You have to pay your credit card payment. That's what the interest and debt is, it's the government's credit card. They have to make that payment. They don't have a choice. They cannot pay the debt. So when you drill down and really look at what the legislator, the Senate and, and the House of Rep, what they can do, you're probably looking at 25% of the budget they're fighting over, right? And the biggest chunk, a little bit more than that when you count the military, but there's in a lot of the spending, if you look at it outside of, if you don't look at Social Security and Medicaid, you know, very little goes to housing. 
very little goes to education, right? Very little, very little goes to science research, which we've seen cut dramatically over the years. And so, and as that Medicaid, as the as the as the fixed amounts that have to be paid for Social Security, unemployment insurance, Medicaid, and Medicaid, as that grows, that gives less, and the and the national debt grows with your interest in debt. That gives government less flexibility to change how they spend money, right? And so, a lot of this debate at the federal level of what we're going to spend or how we spend the money is basically over maybe 40% of the budget, if that, if you count the military, which they generally, the military is pretty consistent in how they spend. And so, and remember the military, that's a lot of jobs. So if you cut the military, you're cutting soldiers, you're cutting jobs, right? You're cutting jobs in the private sector. So it does have an impact. Um, you can't just cut the military and then think that's a savings. Well, you know, that means there's less jobs at McDonald or Boeing in St. Louis, right? And that's less income coming in. So there's a trickle down effect. Um, but the thing to remember is, you know, a lot of times their hands is tied. Their hands are tied on what they can actually allocate money to because so much of the budget is taken up by things that by law they have to spend it on like Medicaid, Medicare, Social Security, unemployment. You can jump to the next slide. Now let's talk about the city of St. Louis, my favorite place. And in, in my role as the fiscal advisor to the Board of Aldermen, um, I assist at the Ways and Means Committee in overseeing the budget process. And so one of the things to really understand is that in the, particularly in the city of St. Louis, the city of St. Louis, it has a structure that has one of the weakest mayor systems in the United States. So the mayor does not have a lot of power to dictate spending. Um, the mayor makes suggestions, but it's really the ENA committee, which is comprised of the mayor, the president of the Board of Aldermen, and the um, comptroller, and the Board of Aldermen itself that makes all spending decisions. And so that's something to understand. But when you look at the budget, the big, big important thing to really understand is you have a general fund budget. So whenever you hear the word general fund, those are, those are revenues that the Board of Aldermen or any government entity because these, these language is used throughout local government. The general fund is always money that can be allocated any way you want to, right? So they could spend that, that um, $519 million any way they want to. Special funds are actually, they're like social security. Those funds have a dictated purpose by law. That could be local ordinance, that could be state statute, that could also be federal. Grants are the same way. Right? When you receive a grant as a government, you have to spend it as a grantee as, as asked you to. Um, debt service, you have to pay your debt service. So that's a four savings. What's one of the things that's very unique about St. Louis is, and you see this um, a lot um, at the government level, is the government actually a lot of times will own quote unquote businesses. Inter and these with the enterprise funds. The two businesses that the city of St. Louis owns are the airport and the water company. So when you get your water from the city of St. Louis, which is known for having the best municipal water in the United States, you're actually getting your water from a government entity. Um, city of St. Louis has two water plants, one on each river, um, and also has access to an aqueduct up where the Missouri and the Mississippi meet. And so those are budgeted as kind of standalone enterprise businesses that, that basically fund themselves, right? And so, again, when you look at the budget, you have to think about, okay, how do you bring money in? If you could jump to the next slide. So this gives you kind of a breakout of kind of functional how you spend, how the government spends money. And again, how you spend your money as a budget is a moral document. The thing that obviously jumps out is public safety. The city of St. Louis spends an enormous amount of money on public safety. That's not just the police department, right? That also includes... Um, that also includes tr the sheriff's department, the transportation, the jail system. Um, and if you think about the level of crime, the city of St. Louis has a particularly a violent crime, has a high level of crime, which also increases the public safety cost. If you combine the number of murders in the city of St. Louis and St. Louis County, it's roughly equal to the number of murders in LA County. LA County has 10 million people, St. Louis city and county combined have about 1.3 million people. Same level of murders, right? So there's an enormous public safety cost 
you know, uh, you know, obviously of life and as well as of treasure of funding. Um, but be, because of that cost, it puts huge, huge impacts on human services, social services. So let's jump to the next slide. So it's important to understand how you make your money, right? So one of the unique unique items for the city of St. Louis as far as how they make money is an earnings tax. In the state of Missouri, only two entities are allowed to charge a 1% earnings tax, the city of St. Louis and Kansas City. Because of the demographic makeup of the city, um, and the earn you pay the earnings tax whether you live in the city, if you live in the city, or if you work in the city. So if you live in the county but work in the city, you pay the earnings tax. The earnings tax is a third of the, of the city's revenue. If, if they didn't have the earnings tax, they couldn't function, right? You know, if you think about how other municipalities outside of St. Louis are functioning with sales tax and property tax, St. Louis, if it didn't have its earnings tax, would basically lose a third of its funding and would probably be near insolvency. And so that's something that's one unique to the city. It's very important. Um, and without it, it can't survive. And it actually, it gets renewed every, every five years, which it's on the ballot this year. And so that's a unique thing. So, so managing, and, and when you're managing a city as far as revenue, you have to think about it like a business. How, you know, how, do, you, how do you increase revenue without increasing taxes? And you think, well, how can you do that? That's impossible, right? Don't you have to increase taxes to increase revenue? No, you don't, right? You can increase economic activity. So when you hear about economic development and trying to increase economic development, what the real goal of that is to increase economic activity. One of the jokes I would always tell the board of aldermen um, during, um, during my uh, time at the board, working for the board and, and working on budget stuff. And I said, we should pass a bill that forces the St. Louis Cardinals to play year round, right? Because if the Cardinals play year round, the Cardinals generate, I wanna say about 12 to $15 million a year in tax revenue. If they play year round, everybody would go and spend money on tickets and we get sales tax and we get sales tax on all the beer and all the hot dogs and all that. And no one could, would complain, right? But we would make more revenue, right? So that's, that's a way of increasing activity, economic activity, increasing revenue without actually increasing taxes on people, right? And that's one of the challenges the city has had is that as, as the county has become more of a destination for entertainment and other things, that takes people out of the city, right? If you have more and more nicer restaurants, more and more nice areas to hang out and spend time within the county, that's less people coming into the city, that's less sales tax, right? As you move jobs into the county, that's that's less earnings tax. If someone lives and works in the county or in St. Charles, they don't pay the earnings tax. And so you always have to be, I tell my class all the time, you have to be respectful of the people that pay the taxes because they can walk, right? And without taxes, without revenue, you don't have a city. Okay, if you could jump to the next slide. Andy, thank you so much. Um, this is a real important slide to look at because this breaks down, as I said earlier, there's no separation between revenue, taxes, and people. People are services. Services have to be paid for by taxes through salaries, right? So this shows the enormous cost of the public safety. This is a breakout of employees, right? And so, you know, of the city's employees, you can see the bar chart is pretty straightforward. And these, these, this data is straight out of their budget presentation. So this is publicly available information. So you see one, that public safety is the majority of employees. You start looking at human services and the health department, which is health and hospitals, the street department, you see very little people, right? Right, and so that's an issue, right? Because if your public safety demand is so high, basically that takes people away from other services. Um, parks and recreation. St. Louis is blessed with a lot of green space. You know, Forest Park is arguably the largest urban park in the United States. The city of St. Louis has 108 parks to maintain. That's a lot of parks for a city with only 300,000 people, right? That's a cost. Someone's got to cut the grass, what have you. All these things we have one of the we have I believe one of the top five largest sewer systems in the United States because the city's so old, right? Think about the bridges, the East Bridge, which is the oldest steel bridge in the United States that has to be maintained, right? Um, 
we have one of the oldest street systems in the United States, right? Because St. Louis is a very old city. The, those are costs. St. Louis as an infrastructure was built for a million people. Right, that infrastructure is built for a million people. We only have 300,000. You still have to pay for that infrastructure. You have to pay for those sewer lines, those water lines, the, le the electricity lines, the roads have to be paid, the bridges, right, have to be repaired. And that all costs. And that, that, that drives people. You need people. Okay, let's jump to the next slide, Andy. So, when this is, this is a slide that shows the workforce over time. And what it shows is when you have a recession, right? If you think about the recession that hit in 2010 and the recovery, the city of St. Louis today is down 433 employees than it was 10 years ago. Are there less services? Is there less demand? No, right? But that workforce is being stretched by 433 people, right? Because if you have budget deficits, you have to cut people. There's no way around it. You can't automate your way out of it, right? A lot of particularly social services, public service, they're, they're people-driven businesses, right? We don't have robots that can respond to, that can respond to calls, like, you know, uh, police calls, right? We just don't have them yet, right? So again, people, services, revenue are all connected. Um, but this shows the impact when you go through a recession, the first thing a city has to do is cut people, right? And again, people are services. And I'll turn it back over to Andy. Thank you very much, Gerard. And and before we shift on to people, I'd like to I'd like to just remind everybody that we that that the the, the pie charts that he showed and, and the breakout of those budget numbers shows this basket of services that we decided as a city as a region that we're going to provide our people and really those those decisions were shaped long ago and that that our leaders long ago were saying hey we need to do this and you know and and he's he's spot on that they thought in 1948 when they did the city plan 48 49 they said we have to prepare for a million people by 1970 and so that didn't materialize but they were building for it and so this focus on people is something that that i think has um is worth exploring a little bit and so the progressives again going back 100 years ago the progressives of then not the progressives now, but the progressives of then, they were focused on people and they really had for the first time this idea that, that we could use science to make life better, as well as restore values of democracy. There's a lot of that activity happening at the same time. But one of the big things that happened in government, and, and this, was, this was so critical, but one of the big things that happened in government was uh, around the assassination of James Garfield. Not many people really know or even have occasion to think about the presidency of James Garfield, but it have a, had a profound effect. Um, he was the first professor president, by the way. Um, Garfield was assassinated by a guy who wanted a political job. I mean, those were the days of, of patronage and, and there was a guy who wanted a job. He didn't get it. He saw the president on a train platform and, and murdered him. And so here comes this new president, Chester Alan Arthur, and, and he shepherds in the idea of a merit system, the idea that, you know what, we need to hire people for bureaucracy because they're good at what they do, not because of their political party. And of course, Andrew Jackson was the, was the president who famously made the spoil system, the patronage system. I mean, he took it to a new art form in how he appointed, gave away uh, positions. And at the same time, this guy, Woodrow Wilson, um, when he was just a professor at Princeton, he was our second professor president. When he was a professor at Princeton, he was writing that, you know what, we need to change the way we study government. And he said, we need to separate the politicians from the practitioners. And really public administration owes its academic history to uh, Woodrow Wilson who for a time was on the $100,000 bill. It'd be nice to find a few of those in your wall, wouldn't it? 
other progressive era thinkers are out there. We all know Max Weber. He was the king of organization. He loved rational principles. He loved saying that, that organizations, public and private, should be very rigid, highly efficient, centralized authority, hierarchical, very almost militaristic. And he loved that and said it was very, very efficient. And he said, that's how government should work. You know, this is the same time that, that, that you know, Jane Adams and Charlotte Rumbold are out there saying, hey, in Chicago and St. Louis, you know, we need to help people bathe. And he's talking about, you know, these rigid structures. Another guy about this same time is Frederick Taylor. And, and he also takes this science approach to that, that so many progressive era folks did, but he has something called scientific management. And he says, public or private, for every job, there is one best way to do it. And therefore, we should all find the one best way. And so here's the, here's the objective now that, that, that we're gonna still make government efficient. We can do more stuff but we have to do it efficiently. And we're gonna find the, the most efficient way, that one best way. Well, a lot of you might've known of the, the Hawthorne experiment that Harvard did uh, back in the 1920s. And it really, was, it really was smart. And so Harvard, which some people call the Washington University of the East, Harvard was in, uh, Hawthorne, Illinois at the Western Electric Company. And, and Western Electric made, made uh, parts for like telephones. And so, you know, there, there was a piece of Western Electric in every household, just like, you know, Sun Microsystems or, you know, one of those microchip makers, Intel is in everybody's house somewhere. Well, that's how Western Electric was back in the day. And they were doing these experiments to, to see how we can improve efficiency. And uh, they look at workers with, you know, in well-lit rooms and in dark rooms and in rooms that are too hot and rooms that are comfortable. And their goal was to improve efficiency. But then this problem comes along that they were seeing higher productivity in these worse conditions. And, and you know, wait a minute, it wasn't supposed to be that way. But as you all, I'm sure, know from the Hawthorne experiment, um, there is this thing called the Hawthorne effect, and it's not about Nathaniel Hawthorne, but about this plant at Hawthorne, Illinois, where efficiency improved, not based on the, the physical conditions, but on the fact that somebody's standing over your shoulder with a clipboard writing down everything you're doing. And so the conclusion that comes out of this is that, is that our work environments, be they public or private, our work environments are social environments. It's the social environment that has impact. And so by the time we get to somebody like Maslow in the 1940s, we're starting to acknowledge that, oh my gosh, it's that social connection that's important. This is exactly what Jane Addams was saying. This was exactly what Charlotte Rumbold was saying back in 1900, but it, it, just, it just took time for this to sink in. By the time Maslow comes along, he does a very good job with, with his hierarchy in, in talking about the levels of human need. And he bases this on the Blackfoot Nation's beliefs. Um, but you know, basically, if I'm worried about number one on that hierarchy, don't be coming to me talking about number four business because I'm not going to think about anything until number one gets done. It's the same thing that, that you know, a, a, a hungry student in the classroom can't learn. We have to feed the child and then we can educate the child. That's exactly what, that's exactly what Maslow is saying. Now there's this woman, Mary Parker Follett, maybe you know who she is. Um, Mary Parker Follett was this brilliant woman. Her biography was called Prophet of Management. And she tried to say all this stuff back in the 1920s, but it literally took a generation for the, the business guys to, to figure it out for themselves. But she was coming up with all of these great ideas and, and, and both the public and private sector weren't ready to, to hear her ideas back then. But by 1960, we get to this guy, Douglas McGregor. And, and I'm sure you, you know theory X and theory Y, it's very, very common. Um, but these are, these are the, he, he defines for us by the 1960, these, these humanist approaches to organizations. 
the idea of theory X, which is kind of the old school thinking that people are lazy and they're going to avoid work and, and they gotta be coerced if they're gonna be productive. If you're running an organization, you gotta ride those employees because otherwise they're gonna be goofing off. And then he talks about theory Y, which is the new, the humanist thinking, the humanist approach that work comes as naturally as play to people and that people are gonna, they're gonna work. They're gonna work really hard for goals to which they're committed. They're gonna work really hard for reward and that reward isn't necessarily monetary. And so he's introducing some really important ideas here. And some people, I mean, this same debate is still about, think about cities, think about how we approach cities even today. How many times do we look at places in cities and say, those people are lazy, those people are just avoiding work. We, we, better, we better police those areas more, straighten those folks out. That is that old style thinking and it shows up today in the conversations and the decisions that our leaders are making today instead of taking on this new humanist thinking, which we've had the, we've known how to do it since the 1960s and we're still, we're still learning. So the humanists changed our approach really in both the management of organizations, public and private, as well as scholarship. And so we're shifting from institutional viewpoints and moving more to people focused viewpoints. We're shifting from focuses on efficiency and really shifting more to effectiveness. So our policy evaluations are looking more at how effective were we? Did we actually meet our goals? Doesn't matter if we spent all the money, did we, it, that does matter, but not just that we spent our money, but that we were effective with our money. And so these principles have really shaped the way we look at public administration today. I put a picture of President Taft playing golf on here because he was the first president, you know, we can point to lots of imperfections there, but he was the first president to uh, admit that he liked golf. And I thought, I thought, how human was that? And uh, he also, you know, he was a very, uh, very large man and he, he didn't hide his, he didn't hide his, his, his physical appearance either. And I thought, what a human, what a humanist approach to things even back in the 1910s. So public administration today is really, really complex. And I think it's really important that we prepare our students to engage it. And that's exactly what this class that Gerard and I are gonna teach in the fall is gonna do. You know, we've had this conservative shift in our country since 1980, since the, the, the Reagan presidency. And really it's meant a, a, a larger embrace of private sector ideas from the public sector. And we call our constituents customers now and uh, instead of constituents. And, and we're still pursuing these cost-saving efficiencies even when it comes at the expense of liberties, you know, thinking like privatizing prisons. How much government power can we actually privatize? That's a really important question. You know, can we give away, can we contract out law enforcement? Can we contract out soldiers? These ideas are, have all been put on the table. Remember this lady from the beginning, Charlotte Rumble? She couldn't get paid. She was not paid. She was the supervisor of recreation for the city of St. Louis and she couldn't get paid. Why? Because she was not a voter in 1908. So she left and got one of the highest paying jobs in New York when St. Louis wouldn't pay her what she was worth. <laughs> and I'm gonna end it there. Wow, that is some really amazing uh, history that kind of ties into what's happening currently in our city. And I love the talk about the budget being a moral document. And I have to say that the discussion in the chat has been really incredibly uh, insightful uh, and um, unflinching. And I'm really grateful to, to those who are attending today who are, you know, really raising some important, important and key and critical issues. And so I, I want to first um, 
remind our attendees to please continue to send in your questions and thoughts. I've jotted down a few uh, and we, we certainly have time. Dan, did you wanna share any thoughts and reflections too before we kick off with some of the q and I've learned not to get in the way of a moving train, um, but I just offer again, just an incredible appreciation uh, to Andy and Gerard for taking the time, uh, both on the history and the, the really detailed snapshot of St. Louis. I have, a, I have a couple of questions that I might mix in as well, but I definitely want to make sure uh, that we get to the great things that have been coming in uh, in the background. Absolutely. Well, Dan, jump in at any time, Janet, too. So first, uh, um, just a, a, a quick kind of clarifying question for the for the earnings tax, is that something that is first authorized by the state legislature and then the cities can adopt, or is that something that, that the city is able to do on its own? It's in the state constitution that only St. Louis and Kansas City can charge an earnings tax. So no, no one else can do it. It was, okay, set up, it was set up just for the city of St. Louis and for Kansas City. And there was a change, I want to say maybe 10 years ago, which forces each city to reauthorize it every five years. And so that will go before the, the voters you said this year. And, and so can you tell- Along with the mayor's race. Along with the mayor's race. And so can you tell me what would happen should the voters decide that they wanted to remove that? It's phased out over 10 years. It's phased out over 10 years. And, and so I see Kate is, but is that Prop E, Gerard, that, that's going to be before the voters? I don't know off the top of my head. I'm sorry. Okay, that's fine. It looks like Kate is saying that that's uh, Prop E. And Kate, you're saying vote yes on Prop E. Does that mean vote yes is reauthorizing the uh, um, that's tax? And just, yes. Okay, great. All right. The, the, the other kind of really um, kind of interesting issues that are come up about the, the, the um, area of public safety and how, and I'm sure Gerard, you've been engaged in a lot of conversations about this because the, the numbers are so high and, you know, is there, and, and the way that public safety is defined, I think is getting tied into this kind of idea of defunding the police. Is there, is there when you're, when you budget and when you're allocating funds to public safety, are there certain criteria by which public safety is defined? Um, it's really, it's a couple of things. So let me just step back and I'm gonna answer your question. Um, yeah. The big thing really, in my opinion, with the city's budget in general is the city does not have a budget problem. It has a revenue problem, right? It needs mm -hmm. to bring in more money. Um, and, and, and because of that, they have to make really hard choices. Like, and, and that was my experience of working with the city is they have to make hard choices because they don't bring enough revenue to fund everything they need to fund. But no, when you say public safety, there's certain departments that fall under the Department of Public Safety. So uh, one of the big costs of public safety doesn't get talked about because everyone, everyone likes that department is the fire department, right? St. Louis has an enormous amount of the largest fire department in the region. I'd say the best fire department in the region. And there's a lot of fires in the city, particularly with vacant buildings. Right. You know, a fire truck costs anywhere from a half a million to a million dollars. Right. A couple of years ago, an older fire truck got destroyed because a building fell on it during a fire. Um, so public safety, you know, is not just the police force. It's 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 the fire department being one of the big, big, you know, the big cost as well, which you kind of have to. I mean, we have a large city. You have to have a fire department. Right. And so it's really defined by department. Right. But the police department is one of the bigger, obviously one of the bigger pieces of that dollar amount. Um, and, and if you look at a lot of their, if you really, we, we got into really budget, you know, budget discussion, a lot of their costs are people. And one of the challenges they have as a department is that they're down anywhere from 100 to 150 officers all the time. Right. And so what happens when you don't have enough officers? You charge you. You basically make your officers work overtime. Right. When you work overtime, what do you do? You get paid more, right? So I haven't looked at their recent budget, but I know at least the budgets I worked on, there was ten to fifteen million dollars a year spent on overtime because they're down so many officers, mm -hmm. right? You know, you think about whenever you look at the news and you see four or five, 
see the thing that you know people always look at the number of murders right and which is huge right um you know it's 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 you know i think you know it's 250 i think or 260 was the number but that's really not that's really not the number you should be looking at it's the number of people who are shot i mean it's thousands right right and that that their police actions on each one of those shootings right we focus on the people that don't make it but if every person don't make it there's probably four or five people that got shot that made it those are all criminal actions that have to be investigated mm-hmm. right and then as it piles up year over year if you don't have a high close rate those cases stay open right and then and then and then that and if you have the same number of murders as you know as shootings or murders that you have in a city like in a, in a county like la county that means you have to say have the same level of public safety structure as a county that has 10 million people right you can't and so that's that's you know that's one of the things to think about if you have the same number of criminal activity in a region as a bigger you're going to have a you're going to have an infrastructure that has to police it similar to that and that's a cost I'd like to jump in on the fire department example that Gerard was just talking about and and tie it back to the earnings tax. I think one of the justifications of the earnings tax uh, paying for so much of the city services, you know, if you think about it, we build our skyscrapers downtown. Think about the fire equipment we have to have just to host a, 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 a skyscraper in our jurisdiction. Most cities don't have that burden, but because some company wants to build a big skyscraper, we have to we have to have more fire equipment to handle it. And so, having those employees of those companies paying, you know, chipping in to pay for that increased cost, you know, St. Louis's daytime population is, I mean, it goes up fifty thousand, seventy five thousand, hundred thousand during the day, and then you know it goes down again in the evening, and so. That's one of the arguments that the earnings tax is just is that you know we are consuming services when we go into the city. Yeah, thank you. I just want to encourage to the, the our attendees to to do a, a Google search for Dr. L. J. Punch, who's doing some amazing work in the city uh, addressing the issue of of uh, people who are getting shot and how to respond and ensure that they are more likely to survive. Um, I, I want to kind of also kind of explore this a little deeper because it, the, the public safety, it sounds very reactive, right? Where, where a crime has been committed or something's happened and then folks get uh, involved. I see Sherez has put a link into the T there. Please, please uh, I encourage our viewers to do that. Is there a way that we can shift public safety, the conceptualization of public safety to be more preventative than reactive and and then then can we define areas like early childhood care and education that have demonstrated that over time that these you know uh, uh children are more likely to be you know healthy and financially well and uh less likely to engage in criminal behavior is there a way that we can shift our thinking of public safety I, well i can do you want me to answer that andy i can answer it go for it yeah i think and that's a huge, that's a big question. I think you have to also kind of step back and understand kind of what's hap- what's happening, right? A, a lot of, I would argue, a lot of the crime in the region is driven by poverty, right? What, what drives poverty? People, people not having marketable skills that will get them a middle-class job, right? That's right. With the hollowing out of the manufacturing sector in St. Louis, that's really hurt you know, that's really driven poverty. I mean, St. Louis used to be the number one auto producer in the United States. We used to produce more cars than Detroit, right? Every Corvette up until what, 83 that was ever made was made in North St. Louis, right? Uh, we used to have three major auto plants. There, there are none left, right? except for Winsfield. And so when you think about, when you think about, and I talk about this in, in my classes, when you think about the American economy, started off as a foreign-based economy, it transitioned to the industrial, and now we're in the information economy, driven economy. And all those transitions, you had enormous upheaval, right? You think about the industrial revolution, enormous upheaval, right? And society had to change to adapt to that. And what it, how it changed, it created things that drive more, more skills, right? 
public education, the going to high school, mandatory high school, free, that all came out of the Great Depression, right? Giving people, that's why public schools, K 12s, they act like factories because they were designed to help people be able to work in factories. We're now not really producing or educating people to get the new information jobs, right? The number one job function for a male in the United States is driving a vehicle, right? The number one job function that won't be here in 20 years is driving a vehicle. What are those people going to do, right? And so to answer long-winded, to answer your question, you have to look at workforce development and economic development, right? How do I create programs to teach people skills to get jobs at Cortex, right? You actually realistically don't need a college degree to go to court to work in Cortex if you know how to program, right? Some of your best hackers and programmers don't have college degrees. Cortex needs program, right? How do you, that's how you solve, in my opinion, is connecting, you know, connecting people with, with employment opportunities through training and then funneling them into those jobs. A lot of people get involved in, in, in these activities as basically a career choice. That's their best option, right? And, and until you fix that piece, right, where people can earn enough on their own, right, it, it solves a lot of the transportation issue. If someone has a middle class job, what is the first thing they do? They buy a car. Right, they don't need public transportation, right? And so, to me, that's how you address it. City spends about five million dollars a year on at Slate. Slate's the organization that does workforce development, right? That is a way of addressing it. I think it needs to be a lot more. I think you need to be more targeted, right? How do you get WashU to help? For example, not every student can go to WashU. We know that, right? But how do you? How does could watch you set up training programs or certificates to get people in high paying jobs over like a ranking, but a ranking for more technology. Think about NGA, right? It, we're going to be the hub for aerospatial, knock on wood, you know, for the country. I mean, it's literally rocket sciences, you know, they manage satellites. How can you create programs, training programs for people, for all these subcontractors who are going to want to come to St. Louis and be next to the NGA site. How do you build programs, finance programs for people to get the job training and get the jobs? If you did that on a large scale, I think the crime rate would drop. Thanks, Gerard. And some really great insights and, and comments and questions coming into the chat as well uh, that I wanted to kind of uh, circle back to the, the time that we have left uh, and kind of pose to both. You know, one kind of uh, thinking again about um, revenue in public administration, uh, government finance and budgeting. Um, and again, with the payroll tax, you know, the kind of impact that um, remote work might have uh, for individuals who might have an employer that's located within the city, um, but they're actually completing the work from outside the city boundaries um, and, and living outside the city uh, as well. There's also a couple of notes and, and questions about uh, how payroll tax might work for uh, organizations or institutions that have nonprofit status. Um, right now, a couple of questions. Uh, that's a couple of questions. So one, um, it's going to end up in court, right? There's, I believe there's already a lawsuit of someone suing saying, why should I pay the earnings tax? I didn't go to my office for the last year. You know, I worked for my, my apartment or wherever in outside of the city. Um, a lot of court and the earnings tax also is paid by two sides. So the company pays a piece and the, and the individual pays a piece, right? Now, nonprofits don't have to pay that piece, right? Um, and there's been debate about whether nonprofits should be exempt from that. Um, there have been several ledgers, several bills that Alderman have proposed to make nonprofits pay that piece. Um, if, if, if the trend of people working for home sticks, which I think a lot of it will, it will be catastrophic for their earnings tax. Right? Because if someone can work from home and they don't live in the city and they don't come in, and it's not just the earnings tax, Dan, it gets broader. You don't need all the cafes and restaurants because there's no lunch crowd. Right? You don't need the stores. Right? It, there's a huge trickle down effect. Right? Um, and it, it, will, it will impact all American cities. Right? Um, you don't need all that density, right? If I can work in Evanston, I don't need to go to downtown Chicago. Or if I do, 
I want to go, I want to go maybe twice a week and I work from home three days a week. That might mean I want a suburban office building that's right around the corner from where I live versus having to go all the way into a, a urban core. So I think, I think it's, I, you know, it'll be decided in court, um, but I, it could be catastrophic. Yeah, thanks for the, thanks for the, the, the thoughts on that. And we had a, a question come in. So just to, to clarify and confirm, um, so employees of nonprofits uh, are still paid a 1% uh, the tax. The employer themselves does not. Correct. Thank you. It seems like that might be able to be remedied with, you know, nonprofits whose annual operating budget is above a certain threshold. You know, that way the, the would, would, need to pay into that rather than those smaller nonprofits who may not be able to, you know, sustain that additional expense. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I actually think one of the, one of the big unique, if we, you know, get into the nonprofit discussion, one of the unique issues of nonprofits in it's in the state issue is that Missouri is one of the few states that nonprofits don't pay or charge sales tax. And that's really the killer. Um, like, for example, one of my alma maters, USC in LA, they pay like $150 million in local taxes. It's all sales tax. So you go to a USC football game, you go, you go they, they have a nightclub on campus, they have hotels on campus, they have a movie theater on campus, you all pay sales tax. If that was in Missouri, there would be no sales tax. If you go to the zoo and buy something, there's no sales tax. Right? The zoo has $40 million in concession sales, there's no sales tax. Right. Southern Illinois University collects sales tax. I'm sorry. I say Southern Illinois University collects right. sales tax. Right. Illinois, campus. exactly. Yeah, Illinois is the exact opposite, right? They're like the majority, right? And so that's that's really where, you know, that's if I if I had to really like have a conversation about the taxation of nonprofits, that's really the issue, right? Because nonprofits, like for example, in Los in California the YMCA almost lost their tax status because they were building these state-of-the-art gyms and putting um, putting like valleys and your big gym companies out of business because of the nonprofit status. And they basically didn't have to pay taxes. And so, you know, if you really want to have that discussion, it's really the sales tax, that's the killer. So I, I, where I see we're running out of time. I know we could do this for another hour, two hours, because it's just such a, a, an interesting topic. I, I want to give you each an opportunity to kind of share some closing thoughts. And I'm wondering if we could steer those closing thoughts to how you think the, uh, you know, the American Rescue Plan might affect either positively or negatively, you know, the, the St. Louis region. I'll let you go first, Andy. <laughs> All righty. Um, I think that the uh, something that we've learned here, I mean, I, I love the idea that budgets are moral documents and, and you know, we, we're, we're pressing government to, to take on, you know, these moral roles. And so I think that the, the assistance from Washington, D.C. is actually very good. I think whenever we bring outside resources into our local economy, that's going to be a net gain. And, and people, people are going to spend that money, and I think we will see a real impact. Is it going to fix all, everything that's wrong? No. But is it going to give us a, a boost when we need it? Yes, I think so. Um, what I would say is, I, obviously, it's good, particularly for the city, because the city got in, is getting you know, half a billion dollars. But, but some of the issues are systemic, right? And if you don't use the money to fix the systemic problem, you're going to be in the same issue in 10 years, right? And, and that's the issue. Um, you know, the vacancy issue. How do you, you know, how do you solve that, right? Um, you have neighborhoods that were built for 100,000 people that have 5,000 people, right? You have a school district that is closing buildings because they have less kids, right? You know, this, at the turn of 1970, I think St. Louis Public Schools had 70,000 kids. Right, K to twelve. Now they have like eighteen. Um, you know, as much as the government's giving us, you know, for this one-time hit, if that money's not used to fix some of these systemic problems, you're going to end up in the same situation or worse in in ten years. And so, using that money to fix systemically systemic problems to me is the key. You know, one-time aid is important, and people are people are hurting. Right. But once you, you, you spend that for one time, aid, if, if they don't recover, 
they're back in need and you don't have the money anymore, right? And that's that's important to remember. How much of that money will go to fix one time, you know, one time things, and how much of that money will go to fix systemic problems where you create more people that basically are more self sufficient. Thank you so much, Gerard. Thank you so much, Andy and Janet and Dan. And to all of our attendees, this has been an incredibly robust conversation. I'm so impressed with our attendees in the chat that's been happening. Very interesting and provocative. So uh, uh, thank you again. We really appreciate your time. I know our students are, are walking away with some really uh, critical fundamental knowledge of the city's uh, administration and its budgeting process. And we also know our, our community members that have joined us are, are grateful for this information too. So we're gonna sign off and uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next open classroom. And again, thank you, Andy and Gerard. Thank you so much.